Hey guys, welcome back to uh, the next vodcast. This is Chapter 6, Section 3, the uh, the New Industrial Age, Big Business and Labor. <clears throat> in this chapter, or in this section, we're going to talk about the uh, robber barons, the, uh, the big industrialists who took advantage of the consumers, who made millions and didn't pay their employees very well. Uh, we've been talking all semester long about uh, the big industries and, and how the consumers are being attacked by railroads and such. And now we're going to get into other areas like oil and steel. And uh, we'll talk about some economic terms. So um, let's go. First, some objectives, things that uh, you will learn as we go through this section. Um, identify ma management and business strategies that contribute to the success of business tycoons such as Andrew Carnegie. In class, we're going to do a practice session on what's called vertical integration, and that'll come up later on in the notes here. Uh, we'll talk about social Darwinism and how it relates to um, the theory of Charles Darwin, but applied to business. And then we'll talk about the growth of labor unions and how those labor unions and the conflicts with management led to really violent strikes. First, Andrew Carnegie. Um, we have watched a video on him. We've done a, uh, we've performed or worked on a document-based question, or currently working on a document-based question on Andrew Carnegie. So really, not a whole lot to say about him. Go ahead and just copy down the notes, and uh, again, pause the video as you need to, and then we'll go on. Let's make Andrew look really young, shall we? Let's give him a top hat. Okay, we come to the first slide where we talk about vertical integration. Vertical integration is the ability to control every aspect of your production. Um, in class, we will do a little activity on this, and if we haven't already, then uh, now you know what's coming up. Vertical integration, you control every aspect of production from raw materials to shipping out the finished product out of your factory. Andrew Carnegie mastered this. Carnegie was a, uh, was a whiz at watching where every penny went. Um, he attracted many of his talented assistants, talented co-workers, by offering them stock options today, that's just a normal offering for people who work in industries and you know something as simple as Walmart. People who work at Walmart get stock options; they can buy stock in Walmart. But uh, for Carnegie, this was something new, and it attracted those talented people because Carnegie was making a lot of money, and people wanted to be a part of that. Horizontal integration is similar to vertical integration, except horizontal. Obviously, you know you go left to right. Horizontal is where you buy up companies that are similar to yours. So if you are in the steel industry, then you buy up other steel companies. And essentially what you do is you eliminate your competition. Social Darwinism is the idea that the strongest businesses will survive. This is taken from the theory of survival of the fittest on, uh, from the writings of Charles Darwin. Now, Darwin did not come up with the phrase survival of the fittest. Um, that was more something that was, I guess, interpreted into his reading. And Darwin wrote about the adaptation of species, even though he used the word evolution of species. Business strategists take this survival of the fittest theory and apply it to business, where the strongest businesses will survive and those businesses have the right to survive while failing businesses or struggling businesses should be allowed to pass away. And by those businesses passing away, um, they do not bring down society. Uh, then the stronger businesses that are 
around that are allowed to uh, continue, buy up those struggling, struggling businesses. The employees go to work for the new employer and can, things continue as normal. Here you see a picture of a typical tenement house. Uh, it can be in any city. It could be in New York City. It could be in New York, uh, Philadelphia, New Jersey, wherever. Um, you have a typical family of, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, and I think if you see this guy's hand there, six, living in an area about the quarter of the size of our classroom. Very typical for tenements at the time. And these are the people who Carnegie believed they weren't poor because of anything they did in life, but they were poor, and that's okay. Because you have to have poor people to work. You have to have rich people to run the business. There's Mr. Darwin. Let's see if we can make him look young. Again, Darwin wrote about the theory of adaptation of the species. People have referred to it as the evolution of species, and that gets a lot of church groups riled up. It's more about adaptation um, to your environment. You take a look at the, uh, the giraffe. Um, the giraffe at one time was a tiny little creature eating the leaves off the bottom of the trees. Today the giraffe is this massive creature eating the leaves off the top of the trees. The species had to develop and had to evolve, had to adapt to its changing environment. If not, the species would have died away. So inside that species is a genetic code for survival. The same can be applied to business. Inside that business, by business management, by business strategies, there is a code. And that code says, I will either survive with the changing times, or I will fade away. Consolidation. As those smaller companies begin to fail and fade away, larger companies buy them up. We call this a merger. When one company buys into the stock and gains control of that smaller company. Consolidation results in monopolies. Consolidation eliminates competition. Look at your picture here above you. This larger fish is essentially consolidating the smaller fish. By doing so, the larger fish is eliminating competition. The smaller fish now will not be eating the food that the big fish needs. Consolidation eliminates competition. Now, the government was not doing anything to step in and stop consolidation. Consolidation results in monopolies. Monopolies, just like the game, result in consumers paying higher costs for the item. Um, recently, within the last two years, AT&T um, attempted to buy out T-Mobile. T-Mobile was okay with selling to AT&T, but what that would have done was reduce the cell phone market to three major companies, essentially creating what um, economists call an oligopoly. I think that's the right word, where you have just a few in charge of the uh, of the industry. If these two were were have been would have been allowed to merge, AT and T would have pulled ahead and uh, would have run the market easily. Now AT and T, a long long time ago, was known as Bell South, and Bell South had a monopoly on the phone industry. The government stepped in, broke them apart, and that's when we started to see companies like, um, boy, I can't even remember the name of them, but I think Verizon is a subsidiary of a, of one of the original companies. Anyhow, it was broken apart a long time ago because the government began to get into the business of regulating businesses. Another robber baron. Uh, we didn't talk much about Carnegie here in the notes because we spent so much time on him in class. Another robber baron, which we will spend time in class, is John Rockefeller. Rockefeller made his money in oil. A lot of people thought he was the devil. Just saying. Very quickly, let's talk about the word philanthropy. Many of these robber barons like Carnegie, Vanderbilt, um, Rockefeller, later in life 
will donate a lot of their profits, a lot of their wealth to society in an attempt to give them a better look to society. Rockefeller, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with Rockefeller Plaza. Um, Carnegie has been, his name's associated with libraries, with colleges, with uh, musical theaters. Um, all of these guys, actually Carnegie was pretty honest in, in, in the way he dealt out his money. He did it because he just felt that that's what should be done. He was one of the first people to really set the tone for philanthropy. Rockefeller does it later in life to kind of cover up some of his uh, less than virtuous dealings in, in the economy. Okay. Early on, we've uh, all semester long, we've been talking about how the government was staying out of business. It was not their business to regulate business. We call that laissez-faire or laissez-faire economics, hands-off. See, the government takes a hands-off approach, and this really hurt consumers, especially farmers in the railroad, in railroad industry. But now we're getting into other industries like steel and oil with Carnegie and Rockefeller. And Carnegie gains control of the steel market through his vertical integration tactics. He bought up all of the supplies necessary to make his product. Rockefeller got control by practicing horizontal integration, where he simply bought out all of his competitors. And there are several ways that they did that. We'll talk about the word trust. Um, not like I trust you to do something, but more like if I own company A and company B, C, and D are all in the same industry, then the four of us come together and we form what's known as a corporation. Well, that was not a good color to use, now was it? We, f we form a corporation. We all charge the same exact price for our services. We offer the same uh, services and if anybody wants to purchase any of our services they all have to pay the same price it doesn't matter who they buy it from they can buy it from me or they can buy it from company C it's the same item at the same price the same quality so essentially these four companies create a monopoly and that's what I was referring to earlier with the AT&T T-Mobile if there are only three main cell phone companies in the nation they would create this trust or this uh, oligopoly Rockefeller uses this strategy in the oil industry. But what Rockefeller does next is to take advantage of companies B, C, and D. So we have all of these companies selling their oil for the same price. If anybody needs oil, they can go to one of these four companies. It doesn't matter which one because the profits, or the, excuse me, the prices are going to be shared equally. And the, the positive thing, I guess the, well, the one thing that makes companies want to come together is that these four companies would share in everyone's profits. Well, uh, Rockefeller secretly began to sell his oil for excessively lower than the other three companies. Now, the other three companies did not realize what was going on and it was too, until it was too late. So you see I've drawn the dollar sign really, really small uh, to indicate that Rockefeller was underselling his so-called trust friends, his, but essentially his competition. He sold his oil so low that he stopped making a profit and he started losing money. He barely had money to pay his employees, which we all know that employees didn't get paid a lot back then. But he barely had enough to pay the, pay the uh, just labor. And he started losing money. But what that did is eventually this company goes out of business and Rockefeller buys up their stock because everybody was buying Rockefeller oil because it was cheaper. This company's out of business. He can raise his prices just a little bit more but still lower than company C and D. Company C goes out of business. Rockefeller buys up theirs. He can raise his prices just a little bit more but still cheaper than his main competition. Company D goes out of business. Rockefeller buys up company D. Guess what Rockefeller does now to his price? He controls the oil market. 
he can keep his prices low because everyone's going to buy from him. Guess what Rockefeller does? Yep. He raises his prices higher than ever before, higher than any of the other three companies. And there's nothing anybody can do about it because the business or the government was not in the business of regulating business. Now, that takes us to the Sherman Antitrust Act. Let me get all this off of here. The Sherman Antitrust Act was designed by Congress to eliminate what Rockefeller had done. Essentially, the monopoly that Rockefeller created was interfering with free trade between states and with country. Everyone was forced to buy his oil, and that's no longer free trade. Everyone should have the right to uh, pick what cell phone company they go to or what gas company or what gas station they use. That's called free trade, free enterprise. The government started to regulate business in regards to trusts like Rockefeller, but found it very difficult to do so because the word trust was not clearly defined. Well, what makes up a trust? So businesses, Rockefeller being as, as intelligent as they were, as business savvy as they were, simply reorganized into a, a new corporation, renamed themselves, and now that law no longer applies to them. They would wait on the government to come back with a new law to apply to the new corporation. Cartoon here um, indicating or uh, representing Standard Oil, which was Rockefeller Oil here as an octopus. We'll talk about this cartoon in class. Actually, we'll do a document-based question on this cartoon in class, so I don't want to go into too much time right now, but you can see the octopus has got its tentacles on just about everything in the economy, in politics, overseas. Finally, labor unions. Uh, labor unions are designed for three purposes. Better hours, safer conditions, higher wages. When labor unions got started, that was their main goal, and that is an honorable goal. That's a good goal. Today, labor unions say they fight for the same thing, but today labor unions force workers to join the union, like in the steel industry. If you want to work at, uh, at Mueller Steel up in Springfield, you have to join the labor union. Um, they then take your union dues and they apply it to the political party or the political candidate of their choice without your consent. That's the right that they have as elected labor union members or representatives. If you don't like it, you leave the union. Well, if you leave the union, you also leave your job. Labor unions have become a special interest group influencing Congress uh, beyond what is acceptable, in my opinion. But again, labor unions get started for the worker, to help the worker get better hours, get better pay, safer conditions. Several unions, uh, types of unions emerge. The first, a craft union. A craft union means that if you hold a very specific skill you can belong to a craft union. Making cigars, rolling cigars, is a very high skilled job. You have to really know what you're doing to get the cigars wrapped tightly. Um, so it's a skill that you possess. You can belong to a craft union. The other type of union is called industrial union. If you can stand in one spot and put nuts on bolts for 10 hours a day, then you can belong to a industrial union because it is mainly for unskilled workers. Track layers. You, ha you kind of have to know what you're doing, but anybody can pound a hammer just about. Uh, you can see the American Railway Union is, is for mainly for unskilled workers. Again, there are, there are some necessary skills that go into laying track, and those people could also join a, an industrial union like the ARU, but the ARU was developed because the unskilled worker had no representation while the craft unions were focusing only on the skilled workers. Finally, a third group comes around, the IWW. This would be a, an industrial union 
because it accepted skilled and unskilled workers and it was the first union to accept African American union, uh, workers. This political cartoon shows capitalism in the form of uh, not an octopus, a uh, starfish, I guess, five, five tentacle octopus. And what they're saying here is that capitalism leads to prostitution, capitalism leads to war, capitalism leads to child labor, leads to poverty, leads to wage slavery. Well, who's going to stop that capitalism? Well, the industrial unions, the IWW, socialism. Socialism is the nemesis, the enemy of capitalism. Anytime the economy goes bad, you start to hear these socialists pop up in the news and talk about how bad capitalists are. It's not anything new. We will look at a 1948 cartoon in class, so someone please remind me to do that. It's a really good cartoon. Anyhow, the IWW, Industrial Union, skilled, unskilled workers, and African American workers. The ARU, the American Railway Union, skilled and unskilled workers, Industrial Union. The first group to emerge in craft union was the AFL, the American Federation of Labor. That is a craft union for skilled workers only. One thing about the AFL, they use collective bargaining. Collective bargaining is a tool that is designed where you have a large group of workers and you have one representative and you have the factory, factory, workers, rep, and this factory is the employee, employer, excuse me, representative. Factory workers. The employer who owns the factory sits down with the union reps and they work out a compromise either to prevent a strike or to stop a strike. The representative represents the workers. Collective bargaining is what goes on right here. It's a way to win workers' rights. And again, the rights that most unions fight for are better hours, better pay, better conditions. As the collective bargaining begins to fail and strikes continue to play out and get longer and longer, strikes turn violent. The first strike is the great strike, the first main strike, great strike of 1877. It happened in the railroad industry. This took place over several states. It stopped traffic, rail traffic, for over 50,000 miles. It's eventually stopped by a government order issued by President Hayes. The B&O Railroad petitioned President Hayes to step in and stop the strike because the B&O Railroad worked inside, in and out of uh, Washington, D.C., and they were the principal mail, mail carrier for mail coming into the nation's capital and out of the nation's capital. So DNO says, hey, they're stopping all the mail coming in and out of Washington, D.C. They're essentially stopping the, uh, the workings of our government. So President Hayes steps in and tells the workers to go back to work, calls in the National Guard to, stop in, to step in and stop the strike. Haymarket Affair, uh, this, was just, is, this was a strike in, in just general factory work overall, not specifically one industry. Um, it takes place over several states. In Chicago, it's the worst. Uh, in Chicago, we see the worst uh, violence. Seven policemen are killed. The policemen are there simply to keep the police. Because seven policemen are killed, we see the public um, start to turn against labor unions. Labor unions are viewed now as no longer working for the rights of the workers themselves, but more to just be uh, troublemakers. Homestead strike. We've talked about the plant, the Homestead plant, owned by Andrew Carnegie in Homestead, Pennsylvania. So this was a strike in the steel industry, and in the uh, History Channel video that we watched, uh, you know that the uh, the Pinkertons, a secret detective force or a vigilante group, basically was called in by Henry Frick to put down the the strike. Uh, nine people die. The National Guard again is called in. The government, federal government, is called in to stop the strike.
Pullman strike. We've talked about George Pullman and the railroad, in, railroad industry. Again, the strike took place over several states and the same result. United States government, federal government is called in to stop. Those people responsible for starting the strike are, are blacklisted from the industry. That means they can never get a job in any railroad company in the nation. This is the walkout from the, the Pullman plant. Women also organized to help labor uh, labor unions. Uh, this is Mary, Mother Mary Harris Jones, or Mary Harris Jones, Mother Jones, however you want to re refer to her. She she mainly worked with families uh, whose husbands worked in the coal mines, whose husbands and children worked in coal mines, and uh, she found 80 of the roughest, most um, injured children and marched them down Pennsylvania Avenue right up to the uh, White House doors. This was, a, this was back in a day and age when, when there were no iron gates around the White House. You could literally walk up the steps and knock on the front door of the White House. And at the time, President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, was sitting as president. And because of that, what he witnessed uh, among these 80 children, he encouraged Congress to pass many child labor laws. Um, mainly laws such as children can't work X amount of hour, longer than X amount of hours. Uh, children of a certain age must attend school and are, on, are not allowed to work. Labor unions gain strength and uh, as I mentioned earlier if you want to work in the steel industry you have to join the union. Um, one of the first attempts at this was what we call a yellow dog contract. Uh, basically you um, the employer to fight the unions early on would hire workers and force them to sign this yellow dog contract which meant that they would promise never to join the union well that doesn't exist today because that's a violation of workers rights and some would argue that a uh, violation of workers rights is forcing them to join the union Employers would use the, the, the wording of the Sherman Antitrust Act against unions saying that they were in uh, prohibiting free trade among the states. Uh, management hurts commerce, interstate commerce, any, or strikes. Management would say strikes hurt commerce. Anytime a strike occurs, it interferes with uh, free trade, free business. And the government would step in. And uh, in labor history, one of the worst accidents in labor history we will take a look at this um, specifically in class. The incident is known as the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. 146 uh, women, a few men, but mostly women, die in this fire. The fire is a result of poor uh, working conditions, locked doors, and uh, inadequate escape systems like the, the out, outside stairs, the balcony stairs, um, fell, like pulled away from the building and fell because of the of so many people trying to use it, the weight of so many people using the the stairs um, collapsed. Here you see a photo of women who have jumped from the 13th floor. I think it's the 13th floor. Um, they thought they'd take their chances with jumping as opposed to being burnt alive. Again, we'll talk about that more in class. So a lot to go on in this chapter. We talked about trust. We talked about vertical integration, horizontal integration, the growth of labor unions. A lot to go on here in Chapter 6.3. It's kind of a culminating unit of everything we've been talking about so far. All of the pressure, all of the tensions mounting up uh, following the Civil War. And it finally explodes in, in several major strikes across the country. Uh, I'll see you guys in class. Later.